You know, now that gold has taken off in terms of its nominal price, the spot contract price, there's a lot of questions and discussions around that spot gold and the different types of physical gold and how those function in relation to the gold mining stocks and all these paper, intangible, tangible. So today, I'll not only show you the differences between these types and their functions, but I'll show you how the Well Shield strategy incorporates the four biggest areas we all need to protect around our wealth through this economic reset that we are already walking through. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Analyst here at ITM Trading. You know, we are a complete physical buy, sell, trade, gold and silver company. And right now, the global economy is undergoing a complete, well, it's a complete reset in every area, whether it's social, but today we're gonna talk about the economics. This is specifically what our gold and silver strategies are designed to safeguard you from. And these videos, especially this one today, is designed to help you see the truth of what is really happening and then help you understand how to protect yourself. So since we've been getting a lot of questions on, well, okay, you have a strategy, what's next? I'm gonna show you what's next because I know personally, I want my wealth to last forever, not just through my retirement or, and I, don't worry, I'm not retiring, or my children's life, but I'm a strong believer in dynastic wealth, which is the kind of wealth that lasts through generations at least 300 years. And the Wealth Shield strategy is about wealth protection, sustained living, opportunity positioning, and legacy building. So these are the things that we're gonna talk about today. But I wanna take you back in history so that you can get start to get a different feel for what happens between the intangible gold products like ETFs, gold mining stock, uh, mutual funds, the derivative contracts, and the physical markets. So the top is the spot gold contract that dropped about 32%. Then gold mining stocks, you can see they're a lot more volatile because that's not, you're not really buying gold, you're buying stock in a company that mines gold. And so that means there are a whole bunch of different costs associated with this. And finally, in the physical collectible gold coins, and of course, in 2008, it made, they made this trend high. So the question really is, well, what should I hold? You know, paper is more convenient, but is that really the proper form to support the function of what you personally are trying to create? So wealth preservation, sustained living, opportunity position, positioning and legacy building. So first, let's take a look at, this is just a short-term graph, uh, gold mining stocks and spot gold. Now, this goes back to uh, November 22nd and it's through September 9th. So I pull, pulled this the other day. And here's your short-term. And we've talked about this before that anything can happen on a short-term basis. But gold contracts, in other words, spot gold, it's really about leverage and short-term trading. And you can see that in this window of time, and this is March when all of the stock market made a low, the gold miner stocks are also floating up or flying up, however your perception is, with the rest of the stock market. Okay, now this is the longer term 
because gold mining stocks, as I said, that's about management, future production. You don't really own the gold. But these are those same two areas, the spot gold versus the gold mining stocks in a longer term trend. And what I particularly want to bring your attention to is here's 2008, like I showed you in that first one. And that's actually when they decoupled because primarily up to that point, they kind inside of this trend, they were moving in tandem with each other. So, you know, short term, okay. Now gold mining stocks are outperforming the spot gold contract at the moment, but longer term, you get a much different view. I'll also point out to you that where spot gold has concluded that cup, it's trading up here. Well, gold mining stocks have not, but they ha are still building a base. So it depends on, it always depends on what you're trying to accomplish. And you have to remember, this is not a, a <laughs> this is not a normal market. All you have to do is really look at it and you can see it. But here are where they're similar. They're both intangible, right? You can't take possession of either one of those. So they're held inside of the system and therefore both carry counterparty risk. If you own either a gold contract, a futures contract, or a mining stock, chances are pretty good you are only the beneficial owner. And I'm going to show you why I said that in a few minutes. You don't, you are not the legal registered owner. So what do you own? You own a promise or an IOU or, you know, you don't really own anything. And both can be created in unlimited quantities. Physical gold, anything physical, it's a finite amount. Mm. Okay, next, and I know we've talked about this before, but if I'm doing it on gold, I've got to show you everything. I'm going to show you a gold ETF. Those two are intangible. They were specifically designed to mimic the movement of spot gold. So a Wall Street product that has been created to mimic another Wall Street product. Great. GLD is the largest one. And, you know, we've talked how there's been, you know, a stellar run on gold ETFs. People thinking that they're owning gold. But pull up the prospectus. And in the description of the shares, what do they say? They can be created. They're authorized under the trust indenture to create an issue, an unlimited number of shares. This is about leverage. This is about a product. You don't ever have any access to that underlying gold. And they're very specific. The shares represent units of a fractional, undivided, beneficial. That word sounds good, but it covers up the fact that you are not legally the owner of anything. You are a beneficial owner of the trust. And by the way, they have no value. Those shares have no value. They carry all counterparty risk because any contract is only as good as the counterparty on the other side of that contract. And that is a big key because anything intangible or anything that's contract based, which is all Wall Street and fiat money, by the way, carries counterparty risk. The shares are, I love this one, and we're going to get into this in just a second, but the shares are issued to DTC, Delaware Trust Company, and only in book entry form, which means that you can never take physical possession and hold the shares in your hands. Similar to gold mining stocks, though there may be some that you can actually take physical possession of the shares. But if you don't hold it, you don't own it. Regardless of what your perception is, it does not stand up in a court of law. Shareholders may hold their shares through DTC if they are DTC participants. Are you a DTC participant? No, I'm gonna show you who those are in a minute. 
but you hold them indirectly through entities that are DTC participants. So if you own GLD or SLV or any of those things, who'd you buy them from? They're also beneficial owners, but I'm going to show you that in a second. Oh. Okay. Not only that, but they are a diminishing asset. So you put your hard earned money into this. You, your perception is that you buy, that you're buying gold and that there is gold underlying those shares of stock. And there is, I mean, if I'm going to believe them, there is, but this is out of the 10 K all the links are, are on our blog. You can check them out, but the amount of gold represented by the shares will continue to be reduced during the life of the trust due to the sales of gold necessary to pay the trust's expensive, irrespective of whether the trading price of the shares rises or falls in response to changes in the price of gold, right? So those are ongoing fees. Now this is just from um, April through June and the amount, okay, so I said that. So right now you only have 0.09, let's see, no, through June, 0.09399 ounces of gold to represent an ounce of gold that, uh, that supports the share. And it goes down, actually they sell off gold daily, but they record it monthly. So you would see that every month. Look at the 10K, it's there in black and white. They tell you how many shares they're selling to pay all of these fees. So anybody that goes into this is thinking, well, I have gold. Well, no, because you cannot take physical possession of the gold. So you're paying the fee, you're paying ongoing fees, and you have no access to the underlying gold. You're running all the risk. Hmm, sounds like a good deal to me. What about you? Yeah. Not really. Now let's take a look at what counterparty risk looks like. This is true for every single fiat money product in the world. This is an article out of the American banker, which is for bankers. It's not for people like you and me. And they make quite clear here you don't really own your securities. You just think you do. In the United States, publicly traded stock does not exist in private hands. Private hands are you and me. Doesn't exist. Boy, I'm thirsty today. I'm sorry. By having purchased shares, you are led to believe that you actually own the shares, but technically all you own are IOUs. And how good is an IOU if it goes, you're out of luck. Nearly all publicly traded equities and a majority of bonds, actually all bonds are only in book entry form, are owned by a little known partnership Seed and Company, which you've heard me refer to in the past, but you know, maybe some of you guys are new. I cannot go through this enough. This is critical that you understand what I'm showing you right now, but they are a nominee. In other words, they're owned by Depository Trust Company, DTC. Let's see what that, oh, wow, it's disappeared. Do you think maybe your wealth could disappear? Boom, at a blink of an eye. Yeah, I think so. But that's their magic. It's your nightmare and their magic. Let me show you how this works. This is from a Yale, a Yale Y A L E study done on custodial ownership of all of these stocks, all of these fiat money Wall Street products. Way up here is the legal registered owner. Okie dokie. Seed and Company, which was just created in the 90s to hold them. And let's see who owns Seed and Company. Hmm. Structured as a partnership. In fact, Seed is actually a New York City based partnership of certain employees of DTC. Hmm. Could that be the 1%? 
Seed is a separate legal person from Depository Trust Company, which is owned by DTC participants. Hmm, we'll have to look at that. Who are banks and brokerage houses and not employees of DTC. Yeah, and it is a privately held company. So we've got to look a little bit more at DTC. They're owned, again, by banks and brokerages. So up here, this is where the legal ownership lies. I'm not sure where you are yet, but we'll take a look shortly. Now, here's the thing. Everybody, so here's the legal ownership, but everybody between DTC and, oh, here you are down here, are also beneficial owners. What are their benefits? Well, their benefits is that they have the right to use the equity that you hold in your brokerage account for their benefit. So they can borrow against it and do anything they want with that money. That's a pretty big benefit. That is why this system is leverage upon leverage upon leverage. Because if these contracts were written through the city of London, which is where like 96% of them are, then there are no limitations to how many entities, I mean, this is just a little graph. This is really a big spider web of legal entities that can use the same equity. So think back to 2008. Was it disgusting? Was it immoral? How many people really never recovered from that? But what they did was not illegal because these are the guys that write the laws. And these are the contracts. And if you do not read the contract, you're still subject to the legalities inside of that contract. So it doesn't matter what your perception is. What matters is the law. So here you are down at the bottom. You're also classified as a beneficial owner. What's your benefit? Well, if they pay a dividend, then DTC and all these other entities in between here will pass that through to you so that you don't realize it. You know. So you get dividends and maybe you get to some proxies for some voting. But you get to pay for all of this and the ongoing costs of all of this, whether you see it or you don't see it. And I guarantee you the fees that you don't know about are going to be far more costly than any fee that you know about because people don't like to pay fees, so they hide them. But does it mean you're not paying them? Especially with all these new free brokerage accounts free trading. Oh, you think they're doing it out of the goodness of their heart? Heck no. They're doing it because they make more money. And this is how, because they can use your equity for their benefit. Yeah, they want all of this in-house. As a new stockbroker in the 80s, I remember that talk and how important get those people to keep their funds in-house and they pay the brokers to do that to keep them in street name. So if you're questioning it, just call up your stockbroker or your banker or your insurance guy and say, hey, are my, is my wealth at your firm held in street name? Probably it is. I be would bet you it is. I don't know. Ask yourself who has the bigger benefit because these are the legal owners this is who the courts and everybody else listens to. All you own is an IOU. And these markets are set up to fail gorgeously because the currency is failing. And we're being told that, right? We need more inflation. We need more inflation. Be careful of what you wish for. You're likely to get it. And it may not be what you think it is in the end. So here we are back to the spot gold contract because there's some things happening in here and I've got a lot of questions on it and I thought I would just go over it a little bit more in detail. Now, of course, bullion, which is physical, follows the spot contract, though the premiums 
can expand or contract depending upon supply and demand because there is a finite amount of gold that exists anywhere in the world. Now, we've talked about this in the past when I've done these technical lessons. This red line is the 200 day moving average. So if it acts like a rudder on a ship, there's only so far one way or the other, and I don't care if you're talking about spot gold or any stock or the stock markets, it doesn't really matter. If it's a rudder on a ship, that 200 day moving average, there's only so far one way or the other, so up or down, that it can go before coming back to center. And 10% away, 10% away is considered overbought. So when spot gold had that big run from about 1800-ish all the way up to about uh, almost 2100, I think it was uh, 2046.90, something like that, well, it was at that point about 26% above the 200 day moving average. And I've told you many times, nothing goes straight out, up, nothing goes straight down. You always have to have some bouncing along the way. So here is our bouncing. You can see it right here. But here's something really interesting. It's forming a wedge pattern, like a piece of cheese, okay? So, and you can see it because you have a series of lower highs and a series of higher lows. And when it gets into the, the pointy part of that cheese wedge, well, it's either gonna break out above or break down below. Now, I don't know where spot closed today, but it looked like it could have broken out. So I will double check that. And then when I'm on tomorrow, I'll let you know one way or the other. But if indeed it has breaking, broken out above, which is what I think happened, then you're going to see spot climb higher. That is the next most likely outcome. So technically with this spot gold contract, there's where we are. And that's why you see the bouncing around in here from a purely technical vantage point. But I still want you to understand this is still a contract and it's easy to leverage it's easy to leverage gold cheap push a button not much effort in regard to that okay so what it's really doing is consolidating and currently it still would be technically overbought because when i did this which was what yesterday or september 11th is when i pulled this graph it was 14% uh, above that 200 day moving average. And remember, 10% away is already considered overbought. However, does it mean things can't get more overbought? Does it mean things can't stay overbought, giving the 200 day moving average a chance to catch up to it? But there's your little technical lesson on where spot gold happens to be at this moment in time. Easy to buy and trade it. But with the physical gold, it runs no counterparty risk. You hold it, you own it. And it is a very easy way to take a very, a lot of wealth in a small movable package because that dynastic wealth stool has three legs, real estate, rare collectibles, and gold money. Gold money is, in my opinion, the most important leg because it enables you to both buy this. So that's what sets up that opportunity positioning and the wealth preservation. You see how that works in as the foundation of the strategy? Now, physical, physical silver is also part of the strategy in sustaining your standard of living because if you really, if you're a strategist, I am not a short-term trader. I have absolutely zero interest in anything that really happens short-term. I'm more of a long-term strategist. So what I attempt to do 100% of the time is to identify the long-term trend. And if that trend is positive or if that trend is negative. 
Now look, we've got fiat money, so dollars, right, in this country, and that is in a negative trend. Regardless of whether or not you hear them say, oh, the dollar is stronger or the dollar is weaker, or blah, 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 because the central banks are telling you it is overvalued. We need inflation means the currency is overvalued and they're going to pull value from that currency. Hence, we've lost what? Almost 98% officially, 98% of our purchasing power since the Federal Reserve was installed. Consequently, you have gold that is in a long-term positive trend. Now we know how to identify those in a positive trend, you have a series of higher and higher lows. You can even see it on this little short-term graph. But the higher and higher lows. Because if you keep getting higher lows, you will get higher highs. It's inevitable. There's no way around that. So if you want to just protect your assets, wealth preservation, then all you really need to do is identify a long-term positive trend and just invest into it. That's all. Anything can happen in the short term, but if it's a, if it's a solid long-term trend, the chances are most likely that it's going to keep going in that direction. So if you want growth, on the other hand, then what you have to do is discover the biggest bargain in that long-term asset class. So we know gold is in a long-term asset, uh, long-term positive trend because of the dollars in a long-term negative trend. And here, these are the collectible coins because you know I hear a lot of noise around this. And aside from the fact that, I mean, history tells us that it is quite likely for the government, because desperate governments do desperate things, to, to confiscate overtly the gold. Now, I've heard a lot of people say, well, they won't do that because, after all, we're not on the gold standard anymore. Well, why are they accumulating gold, number one? And number two, there have been a number of countries like, oh, I don't know, India, Vietnam, you know, Russia, not Russia, Venezuela, that have indeed confiscated gold from their citizens. And they're not on the gold standard either. So that argument to me doesn't really hold water. However, since all, not all of my wealth, obviously I'm executing the strategy, but I have a chunk of wealth that I want positioned for those growth opportunities that will then generate income for me that I can live off the rest of my life. I can't outlive it. And it's dynastic wealth. It's real wealth that lasts in families for 300 years. I want to pass it down to my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. Because I see what's going on with this surveillance economy. What can you put your wealth into that they can't surveil? Well, at the moment, there's only one thing, and that's physical gold and physical silver. Physical wealth that is completely outside of the system, it is why it is a true portfolio diversifier. This is the long-term chart of collectible coins. You can see a series of higher lows building a base, but it's not as far along as spot is because there are more participants in the spot market and they can control the spot market, but they can't really, and that's what they use to control whether you or I buy physical gold and silver. It's about psychology, perception management. If they can manage how you perceive things, then they can manage how you move forward. I look at too much of this stuff, it doesn't work as well with me. But you can see here that the premiums on these coins are the lowest that they've been recorded because this is a collectible coin premium to the spot gold market. It's the biggest bargain in the asset class. 
So you want to have a well diversified portfolio, no matter what it is that you're doing right? You want to have some asset protection. You want to have some growth. You want to have some wealth building opportunities. You want to have some physical gold and physical silver, especially if what you're sitting on, Meg, I want to go back to this graph. Okay. If your wealth is being held in this system and subject to counterparty risk, you need, well, you get to do whatever you want, but my suggestion is you need to protect it with something that is not in the system. And look, I can't tell you for sure one way or the other whether or not they're going to confiscate, physically confiscate gold. A lot of people think that, oh, that won't happen. History does not tell that story, so that is more of just a hopeful opinion. But I like the kind of gold that it doesn't matter whether I'm right or I'm wrong. And since I know, I'm going to go back to one more. Sorry to do this to you today. But because I know that these are the biggest bargain in a long-term positive trend, and there is no fever like gold fever. No fever especially when people actually recognize it. We saw what happened in March and April. We saw what happened in 2008. There's a lot more metal that is off the market and not coming back on. So what happens this next time when there's a rush? We're already seeing shortages. Those premiums, ah, I got to show you this. Okay, this is a short term, just a one year graph on this. The premiums are starting to rise. But they're still dirt flipping cheap. So that's why this is the foundation of the strategy. Because it's outside of the system. It's in a long term positive trend. It is the most private thing that you can do. It's indestructible. Those contracts, boy, those are easy to destroy. We watch them evaporate all the time. But physical gold, indestructible. So it is a perfect way for you to carry a lot of wealth in a tiny package. Real estate, which is one of the legs, well, let's see. You can't put it on your back and move it around. So real estate is fantastic, but it's not movable. And those property taxes are going to go up because this is how, how municipalities and states generate income. So the gold will help you pay those taxes and maintain that property. And when the opportunity presents, because we've got an awful lot of real estate, mortgage moratoriums that are out there, and a lot of commercial real estate, you're going to be selective, but there are going to be opportunities galore galore and historically 25 ounces of gold or the equivalent would buy an entire city block buildings and all so it puts you in the position to generate income that you cannot outlive and maintain those properties because you can talk to the people that have tenants in there that can't pay their bills but would those properties be better off sitting empty? Mm, maybe not, because we know that properties deteriorate a whole lot quicker when they're not occupied. So how about having some really good tenants that you have the ability to support through this mess and help you maintain the property? And rare collectibles? Well, yeah, rare collectibles are fantastic. You can do all three of them, in fact, with gold, but there could be some rare collectibles that are very fragile, so they're not easy to move. But if you have, you know, a, a collectible coin where there's only three, that's a pretty rare collectible. You're holding an awful lot of wealth in a smooth, in a small movable package. See a smoothable package. <laughs> So I think you can see the reasoning behind it and how the physical gold actually supports that wealth shield. 
And I hope you can see why I'm saying to you that 100% it is time to cover your assets with the Wealth Shield. So this week, Meg, can I have that, yep. that up? Um, okay, in fact, I think that's tomorrow. I'm on with Jason Hartman, and we're going to be talking about that real estate. And I'm really looking forward to that conversation with him. And I'm super excited. And some of you may have even uh, seen my guest before that I'm going to have on Coffee with Lynette, Kirian Van Hest. He is so good about talking about, remember how I've talked about, um, in the COMEX exchange or on the London bullion market, that normally those, those futures contracts on gold, it's just about rolling them over, but that lately they've been standing for delivery. We're going to be talking about that on Wednesday. You do not want to miss this interview. He's fabulous. If you haven't seen him before, I'm so excited to have him on. There are lots of questions from today, and since I'm running long on this video, when we're done, I'm going to answer all of those questions, and then Megan will probably post those Friday, um, Sunday, depending upon, you know, we'll get through all of them because, you know, I always like to answer those questions. And next week, on another Coffee with Lynette, I'm going to be on with my good friend, Egon Von Greyers, and you know, what can I say about him? He is so brilliant and our conversations are so fantastic and I wish I could fly to Switzerland and have this conversation with him in front of the Matterhorn. But we'll have to do it via Skype or Zoom and um, I'll bring that to you next week. So again, it is time to cover your assets. Please, please, please. The Wealth Shield is the way to go. You can call us. We'll explain everything to you in more detail, but I hope you can see the foundation of it. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.